Well, let's go ahead. Thank All you, right, Jack. All right. Um, well, you know, thanks, Jack, and uh, welcome to, to everybody to today's uh, office hour session on, you know, how TDR participation works. Um, you know, the, the primary purpose of today's session is to give, you know, contract holders and the schedules program the information needed to assess whether opting into the, the TDR program is, is right for you and your company. Um, but for those who are already participating, we hope you pick up some other useful information along the way. There's a lot here. So, um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll talk to uh, a, a bunch of pieces today. So, you know, we framed today's session in terms of industry questions. So, as Jack mentioned, we'll start with some foundational information on TDR. Um, and then we'll talk about how to opt into the TDR program. And, and after that, we'll show you how monthly reporting works. Um, as Jack indicated, we'll post these slides on Interact after the event. Um, so you can find the resource links uh, to everything we'll be showing today. All right, so uh, let's hop to the next slide. So uh, first things first, you know, what is the TDR program? Um, you know, simply put, TDR is GSA's means of collecting line item sales data from contract holders like you. Um, think of it as the difference between a detailed receipt from a store versus a rolled up monthly invoice. You know, we want that really long receipt um, with, with all of the lines of data on it. Um, because in the end, getting that data allows GSA to answer a couple really critical business questions. What items and, or services are being actually being bought on the multiple award schedule program and, and certainly other programs that participate in TDR across, uh, across FAS? And, uh, you know, what prices are customer agencies actually paying for those, uh, those items and services? Without TDR, you know, under legacy pricing disclosure requirements, all GSA receives is, uh, you know, catalog information and quarterly sales reports. There's some great information to be gleaned there, um, especially now that more of you have baselined into the FAST catalog platform. But, you know, it's not enough to get a, a, a full picture of what's being bought at the line item level. Moreover, catalog ceiling prices are kind of like the sticker price on a car. Um, in order to really understand the market and conduct thorough market, market research, um, you know, on the GSA side, we owe it to our customers to understand not only the ceiling rate, but the actual price paid so that we can understand cost drivers like seasonality and supply and demand, locality-based pricing, um, you know, different moving pieces like that. So not only does TDR give us all of this data, um, but we've been told by you know, your fellow industry partners that TDR as a whole is a less burdensome alternative compared to legacy pricing disclosure requirements. And it's more modern in terms of how we can receive, process, and, and operate, operationalize the data um, that you know, we get at scale. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we feel that based on that, uh, based on information collections we received previously, um, you know, GSA, uh, believes that TDR saves contractors over 22 hours annually, um, compared to legacy pricing disclosures. Um, you know, uh, participation in TDR is an option, um, if you have at least one eligible SIN. Um, you know, let me be clear that we want as many contractors as possible to participate in, uh, in TDR because we're learning from the data you share, and it allows us to share some of that market intelligence back with you directly. All this is stuff I'll cover more in depth as we go through the slides. But we recognize that it might not be the, the best fit for every contractor in every scenario, um, or that TDR is maybe not yet available uh, to all of you. So we're working hard to remedy that in future years. Um, and uh, you know, if you want to know precisely what SIMs are eligible on TDR, again, we'll we'll hit this a little bit more later. Um, you can look at the available offering spreadsheet on uh, on on our on our main page. Um, if we can go back um, a, a slide, Rachel. Thank you. Um, so uh, you know, you might be asking yourself, um, you know, when uh, you know, if TDR is optional, why would I opt in, right? So the short answer is it's cheaper and easier than legacy pricing disclosures, um, you know, both in concept uh, by the, so that's from its original design and really in reality, based on what we've heard from you all. Um, as I said before, based on the industry information provided directly by industry, TDR saves an average of 22 hours per contract annually. Um, TDR exempts you from multiple legacy reporting requirements. You know, the trade-off here is that you have to report 16 detailed data elements to us monthly rather than aggregate sales data quarterly. So uh, how do we how do you know if you're eligible? 
Um, if we can hop to the next slide. Um, let's get uh, a little weedy for a couple minutes because uh, you know sometimes that's where the really good stuff is. Um, with uh, Solicitation Refresh 22 to the Multiple Award Schedule Program, we're really excited that we just made 67 additional uh, product focus special item numbers or SINs um, eligible for TDR. This uh, That refresh happened last week. Um, so there's more opportunity to opt in now, uh, now than there has been in the last several years. Um, there's two ways to figure out which SINs are eligible, right? So one, you can go to the TDR webpage on gsa.gov. Um, which we certainly, uh, you know, uh, recommend. But, uh, you know, we also uh, really hope that you uh, look at the mass available offerings attachment to the to the, the mass solicitation. Um, you can check column J. Um, so as you see here, column J has uh, a Y for yes or an N for no to indicate um, whether the special item number is eligible for TDR. You only need one uh, eligible SIN on your contract to opt in for the whole contract. Um, I want to encourage you to go take a look. Feel free to even do it now. Um, and if you go to the solicitation, you can kind of get a two for one by also checking on your commodity code, which is our, our next piece of information. So uh, if uh, so, what else uh, is this, uh, you know, mass available offerings attachment good for? It's helpful for understanding uh, the, the SIN service commodity code. So uh, if you look at uh, column I of the attachment, um, it describes each SIN as uh, coded C for commodity or basically products, um, S for service or B for both. Um, so the service commodity code is intended to describe the preponderance of work under the SIN. Um, and there's uh, you know, sometimes exceptions where a service may be sold on a, on a code C set. But uh, your selected uh, SIN uh, service commodity code matters for TDR because it governs which fields are required. Um, and our field controls and SRP, uh, the sales reporting portal, is the, the system uh, where mass vendors uh, report transactional data also looks at that code. So why I wanted to, to share some of this information so you're aware of, uh, of the, the, the included coding. Um, so let's talk about uh, TDR data elements. Um, so you might be wondering, you know, what what's included in a, in a TDR submission if you're uh, if you're not familiar. Um, so each monthly transactional data report uh, that gets submitted to us in the sales reporting portal includes rows with 16 columns of data uh, for each sales line. Item. Some of the columns or fields are collected for products or commodities only, um, indicated by the C only tags, um, while others are collected for all transaction types, indicated by you know, C, S, or B. Um, as I explained on the last slide, field requirements and SRP controls are governed by that code. Um, so uh, think about a, a TDR report like that receipt, right? Like I mentioned earlier, that lists all the line items um, purchased and uh, you know, the unit prices, quantities, identifying information. So uh, we collect uh, item information, including you know, the special item number, which I've been talking about, um, a description of the deliverable, a unit of measure, manufacturer name, manufacturer part number, and uh, and universal product code. Um, you know, we collect information about the buyer. So uh, non-federal entity allows us to identify state and local buys. Um, so state and local entities can buy from the schedules program in certain circumstances. And this helps us identify, uh, you know, if, if that was the sale that we're talking about. Um, the federal customer field, which we just rolled out as optional on July 1st, uh, allows us to analyze federal spend by, you know, tier one federal agency. And this is incredibly important for smaller dollar transactions that never get reported um, into some of the larger systems like the Federal Procurement Data System or FPDS. Um, you know, we collect information about the contract, including contract or BPA number and uh, the delivery or task order number or uh, procurement instrument ID. Um, you know, these fields allow us to join TDR data to information you already port, you already report, like an FPDS. So hopefully that, you know, the reason why we collect that data is so we can do those joins and, and make uh, the reporting easier and let us get a, a, a full picture. Um, you know, finally, we collect uh, purchase information you'd normally include, um, you know, on that receipt, right? So uh, the quantity sold, the unit price, the total price, um, and then three optional fields that apply only to products, order date, ship date, and zip code ship to. 
Um, the four optional fields that we just rolled out in July are marked with stars on the slide. Um, and uh, on the next slide, I'll show you the same information kind of framed up a, a different way. Um, so if we can uh, hop to that next slide, uh, certainly no folks absorb information in different ways. So, you know, this slide really contains similar information to the previous slide, visualized differently, um, but uh, wanted to make sure we kind of uh, slice it both ways so folks have the information. All 12 of the, the base fields are required for product SINs, um, whereas services don't need to report manufacturer name, part number, or UPC. Um, both SINs uh, only need to report those fields for products. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to give you this information in different ways, and I know these decks can live on, so hopefully this is a, a, a useful different way to visualize this information. Um, so uh, let's hop to the next slide, and, uh, you know, I've kind of said enough about fields at this point that you're probably wondering how you submit reports in, in uh, the sales reporting portal. So uh, vendors report data, uh, you know, in uh, via Excel upload. Um, or, you know, principally or, or on-screen form entry. You know, we typically receive reports with a higher volume of, of data via Excel, um, and vendors who have uh, maybe fewer rows of data tend to report via screen entry, but it, it's your choice. Um, we also offer an EDI option, but, you know, that's not heavily utilized and is truly, you know, really looking at the, the, the super high volume um, line items. Um, so uh, let me uh, just talk a, a little bit more and, and kind of start to close some of the thoughts out about uh, TDR more broadly. Um, and, uh, you know, then I can hand it over to, uh, to Steve to talk a little bit more in depth. Um, you know, uh, so again, why is GSA using TDR? Um, you know, we're, we're using TDR data to analyze actual line item sales and, and prices paid. Um, you know, we think that the TDR makes doing business with GSA easier for our industry partners, right? Um, we've already covered TDR's burden reduction, but we're also sharing TDR data back with our vendors um, via a couple different channels, uh, via demand data on the, the vendor support center for top selling items in the program, um, as well as via uh, data provided to industry uh, in the pricing and compliance report um, for those participating in the fast catalog platform. Um, you know, and we're always uh, actively looking for new ways to share this data uh, publicly so that industry benefits from the market intelligence, you know, we're deriving from, from these submissions. Um, and even if you aren't seeing the data directly, GSA is leveraging this data to answer key, quiz, key business questions and, and, you know, frankly, to, to you know, uh, help industry partners in a lot of different ways. Um, there is a recent use case uh, around our uh, second generation IT BPA um, which used our transactional data to analyze high demand items um, that, uh, you know, customers were buying. And when they started digging into those items, they discovered that they were, uh, you know, only being provided by uh, large business resellers. And basically, they looked at them and said the ratio was not what they expected to see. When they dug into it a little bit more, they, they understood that small businesses weren't participating because they lacked the required letters of supply from OEMs. Um, and we're able to engage with the OEMs and, and have that conversation and get additional, uh, you know, small business suppliers, uh, you know, uh, able to sell those products, at which point, um, you know, we've seen that that ratio rebalance and, and, you know, in certain circumstances, even small business sales exceeding other than small business sales. But it allowed us to answer, ask those key questions. Um, you know, frankly, we're using TDR because it's the right thing to do for taxpayers. Um, GSA uh, and and I think all of us owe it to taxpayers to do whatever we can to, to get uh, you know fair deals that make sense um, and uh, you know leverage the data um, to derive pricing intelligence and and find new ways uh, to improve buying outcomes. Um, you know this happens all the time behind the scenes. I, I know in another recent example, um, you know we were able to to leverage TDR. You know there's always conversations that happen behind the scenes. Um, around risk and, and uh, you know, in certain circumstances, uh, supply chain risk. Um, and we were able to, to use TDR data to identify items uh, that were being sold by, um, that had been flagged by another customer agency is problematic from a, a supply chain risk perspective and at least uh, inform customers to have that dialogue. So that's a, a good news story that we're able to, to have that business intelligence and, and understand where sales occur. Frankly, and lastly, we're using TDR because it's great for government. You know, TDR is using, uh, GSA is using TDR to, to drive better buying outcomes for our agency customers. 
Um, you know, it's serving as a resource to our acquisition workforce who are conducting pricing and compliance analyses day in, day out, engage with you all in conversation. And we're sharing TDR data across government via, you know, the procurement co-pilot tool and, uh, you know, existing uh, existing tool sets to look uh, to see if we can leverage this data and, and inform federal buyers of, uh, of the market. So, you know, that concludes my overview. Um, you know, in the end, we're, we're really excited about uh, expansion and, and how that opens up uh, the, the window for more vendors to participate. Um, so uh, let me pass it to Steve Naswatomy to, to talk about how we'd opt in and, and what that process looks like. So, Steve, over to you. Hey, thank you, Greg. I really appreciate the great information you provided on the fundamentals of the TDR program including the eligibility requirements for TDR participation, the benefits of TDR participation, and a look at the actual TDR data reporting requirements and how to submit that data. And in the next few slides, I'd like to discuss the actual opting in process. In other words, how do you become a TDR participating contractor? So transitioning your contract into TDR is actually accomplished through the award of a participate in TDR EMOD request. As a current GSA schedule contract holder, you're probably very familiar with accessing and using the EMOD system to update and make changes to your GSA contract. And just like other contract modification requests, we have resources available to help you successfully submit your participate in TDR mod request to your CO or CS. We've provided two links for your convenience. The first link is a link to GSA's webpage providing information and additional links on the submission of contract modifications program-wide mass mods, and templates that you may need to fill out depending on the type of mod request submitted. The second link is to the current mass modification guide for GSA scheduled contractors. The purpose of this guide is to help you complete and submit the information necessary to request modifications to your mass contract. The guide provides general instructions and a checklist of information required for each modification type. And of course, your mass contracting officer is also available to assist you with any questions or concerns you may have about submitting your mod request and can discuss with you how participating in TDR impacts your contract. And next slide, please, Rachel. And so continuing on with how to opt into TDR, I wanna share some other very helpful links. As we said, Opting in is accomplished through the submission of an award of a participate in TDR EMOD request. And of course, access to the system where you can opt in is through the eOffer EMOD system. So we just wanted to provide you with an additional link here for your convenience. The next link is one we think you will find very helpful as you consider and or prepare for submitting a participate in TDR EMOD request. The EMOD Help Center has provided a step-by-step, screenshot-by-screenshot screenshot view of the participate in TDR mod type EMOD submission process. Viewing and familiarizing yourself with these instructions will help you be ready for the information you'll be required to provide and successfully submit your mod request. Our last link is to the eOffer EMOD Help Center homepage. Here you are able to search for and review information related to EMODs and information on the functionality of the EMOD system itself. And one final point we want to make the here before we move on. <clears throat> While TDR eligibility is determined by special item number, if you opt in to participate in TDR, the entire contract, that means all SINs approved under contract, will be under TDR contract clauses and sales reporting requirements for the life of the contract. And this includes contract options. Next slide, please, Rachel. All right. So let's assume that you have successfully submitted your participate in TDR EMOD request and that it has been approved and awarded by your CEO. So what happens and what can you expect next? So when your participate in TDR EMOD is awarded, the copy of the SF30 you receive will have an effective date of the modification. This effective date is the date that the contract clauses which are in effect under your non-TDR contract are no longer in effect. As of this effective date, the contract clauses and data reporting requirements applicable to TDR contracts go into effect. So the effective date of your participate in TDR EMOD is set to the first day of the next sales reporting quarter following the award of your participate in TDR EMOD. And we do have an example in an upcoming slide that will hopefully make this much more clear for you. 
So the effective date when participation in TDR begins will either be October, January, April, or July 1st. ESA applies this procedure so that there is consistency across the mass program. And most importantly, doing it this way mitigates the risk of issues occurring from switching contract clauses and reporting requirements within sales quarters. Basically, it eliminates confusion regarding violations of the price reductions clause. So until the effective date of the participating TDR modification is reached, your contract will continue to be under traditional or non-TDR contract clauses and sales reporting requirements. You would continue to observe and maintain most favored customer basis of award price discount tracking, and you would report sales on a quarterly basis for the three month period when you participate in TDR EMOD request was approved. And once a TDR participant, the requirement to capture transactional level data, which are the 12 mandatory and four optional elements Greg discussed earlier, begins on the effective date, which will again be either October, January, April, or July 1st. So just to reiterate, the key date to remember and mark on your calendar is the mod effective date, which is shown in the SF30 of the awarded participate in TDR mod. This is the day your contract exits from traditional and quarterly clauses and sales reporting requirements, and the day TDR related clauses and sales reporting requirements begin. One final benefit of the effective date being set as the first day of the next sales reporting quarter is that the time between the award of the participate in TDR EMOD and the mod effective date can be a time that you can use to get your internal systems and procedures prepared so that you can successfully transition your contract into TDR. Okay, Rachel. Sorry, Rachel, my screen is glitching just a little bit here. Okay, so we'll continue to we'll continue talking more about what it means to be participate in TDR. We want to again reiterate that the decision to participate in TDR means that the transactional data reporting requirements apply to your entire contract, and that those requirements will apply to the contract for the life of the contract, including any option periods. Let's now talk about what is no longer required as a TDR participating contract. TDR contractors are no longer under the requirements of the price reductions clause applicable to traditional contracts. The relief from the requirements of this clause provide a significant burden reduction for contractors. As a TDR participating contractor, you no longer have to monitor price reduction violations. You no longer have to provide commercial sales practices disclosures. That's the CSP1 form that I'm sure you're very familiar with. You no longer are required to identify a most favored customer or customers, and you no longer are required to maintain and monitor basis of award price discount relationship tracking. And finally, I do want to mention that in regards to economic price adjustment mod requests, EPA requests still require the submission of commercial price lists or market rate sheets with your request. Please refer to the current modification guidance, which we have linked here, to ensure your requests are in accordance with the established guidelines applicable to both traditional and TDR contracts. Okay, next slide please, Rachel. All right, so I wanna close out this portion of our presentation with a scenario that I hope will clarify some of the things we have just gone over. So let's say your participating in TDR EMOD is awarded by the CO on September 15th. This means the effective date of the mod is October 1st or again, the first day of the next sales reporting quarter. So in this case, your contract would continue operating under quarterly sales reporting requirements and be under traditional or non-TDR contract clause requirements, meaning any mod submitted until the effective date could follow the guidance for traditional contracts. Quarterly sales would be reported for all transactions for July, August, and September. September 30th marks the last day of your contract that your contract is under price reductions clause and MFC BOA price discount relationship requirements. October 1st is the day your contract will now be under TDR applicable contract clauses and monthly sales reporting requirements. This means this is the first day you will begin capturing transactional sales data. November 30th is the deadline for reporting transactional sales data in SRP for October sales. 
and just a reminder uh, that TDR submissions are due within 30 calendar days after the end of the month in which the transaction occurred. All right, that will bring my portion of today's presentation to a close, and I hope that you have found it informative and it proves helpful if you decide to transition your contract to TDR. And now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Mr. Isa Aboud. Isa is the Sales Reporting Portal product owner, and Isa will be sharing with you about the Sales Reporting Portal and details on reporting transactional data in SRP. Isa? Thank you so much, Stephen. I will share my screen with you all. As Stephen mentioned, um, my name is Isa Aboud. I am the Sales Reporting Portal business owner. Let me quickly display my screen here. All right, I hope all of you can see my screen at this point. Let me do this here real quick. So get myself ready. So yeah, as, as uh, Stephen mentioned, I'm the Sales Reporting Portal business owner. And today I'm going to talk about the two main functions for the SRP. How to report your sales and how to pay your industrial funding fee. So SRP has many functions, uh, but I like to think of those two to be the main functions of the system. Uh, we have notifications that go out. We have capabilities for the uh, acquisition workforce to access the uh, contracts that they're assigned. But all of these really are supporting functions to the main uh, functions in the sales reporting portal, um, which is to uh, allow contractors to report their uh, sales and to pay their industrial funding fee. All right. So here's the agenda for today. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the contractor login. And then I will dive into the sales reporting portal overview and methods. Um, uh, we'll look at the contracts details page. And then we'll dive into how to report TDR, how to do sales adjustments for TDR contracts, and uh, you know payments for IFF uh, and, the, and the process for uh, IFF payments. And then we'll look at uh, um, uh, supporting contact information. Okay, So this is the support that we can provide you in case you needed help or if you need to look at, uh, you need to ask questions in regards to how to use the system. All right, so uh, um, contractor login. Please keep in mind that SRP does not have a way to add points of contact on a contract, okay? So you have to have that information in the contract master file, which means uh, the points of contact have to be decided and indicated in your contract. So please make sure that you're listed in the contract uh, to have one of these roles, right? Either your industrial funding fee point of contact, administrative representative or authorized negotiator. Um, if we get emails sometimes that says, you know, um, you know, uh, my colleague uh, is the point of contact and uh, I'm replacing them. Could you please add me in SRP? So the answer is we cannot, right? So that has to be done on the contract side. Um, now, as a contractor or as a user of the sales reporting portal, you do need to register. Um, so there is a method to do that where you would click on the register and then it will basically be very intuitive. You will click your, you know, you enter your email address. And again, the system will compare to the email address that is entered uh, in the contract master file. Um, so that's why you have this third bullet here where it says registration is driven off of the email in the contract file. Um, so uh, registered contractors, you must access the system at least once every 90 days. If you don't access it uh, once every 90 days, you will be locked out. Uh, no need to panic if that happens. All you have to do is uh, reach back to the vendor support center. They're awesome. Uh, and they will help you log back in. The vendor support center is not only there to help you with login issues, but if you forget a certain function or you forget how to enter certain things or uh, upload um, or pay your industrial funding fee, the vendor support center will sit with you, go screen by screen, and they will help you um, get into the system and uh, access uh, what you need to access in order to finish your work, okay? Uh, the next screen here, uh, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of the, uh, of the sales reporting in SRP. Uh, some of you are probably already quarterly contractors, uh, co you know, contractors who hold quarterly contracts. Uh, so SRP supports both monthly or what we call TDR contracts as well as quarterly contracts. So even zero sales have to be reported in SRP. 
so if you have for a certain reporting period no sales have occurred you still you still need to go into srp to report that and i will show you here in a minute it's relatively simple um pretty intuitive you can you can go into the system and with a click of a button you don't have to go to through too many screens but the zero uh sales have to be reported for a specific reporting period and as Stephen mentioned uh, uh, the reports have to happen 30 days after the reporting period ends so um let's pretend that the reporting period is june then uh starting july 1st that's when uh, you can start reporting for june and you have 30 days now july is 31 days if you report on the 31st day of july you will be late it's better late than never uh, but 30 the 31st day is late so please keep in mind it's 30 days after the reporting period um the third bullet here, uh, contractor POC should be current, right? If, 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 if the, the person trying to do the report does not show up on the contract, as I mentioned before, uh, that point of contact will not be able to report. So make sure that is current. Uh, sales reports are transparent. So wh whoever is your industrial operation analyst or your contracting officer, they can see what you did. So if you have an issue or if you try to report something and it didn't go the way you expected, um, um, Please keep in mind that whenever you're in communication with your contracting officer or uh, your acquisition contracting officer, they would um, uh, they would be able to see what happened in the in the SRP in regards to your submissions. Uh, you can submit sales adjustments uh, if you find out that you forgot an invoice or you reported something for the wrong reporting period. You can absolutely make sales adjustments and you can correct that entry for the reporting period. Uh, and also some of you probably know this already, but you can certainly submit closeout sales uh, after the contract ends. So that would uh, uh, generate an email that goes out to the IOA, to the ACO, as well as to the contractor, okay? Um, let's talk a little bit about the reporting methods. SRP supports uh, five, reporting methods. Um, so uh, they're, they're shown here on your screen. Um, um, I'll start with the form entry. Uh, the form entry is the only method available for quarterly contracts, uh, but it's definitely still available for uh, TDR contracts. So uh, form entry is where uh, the contractor would go on to log, after they log in into SRP, they go onto the screen and they enter transaction by transaction or line by line, if you will. Okay, that is still possible uh, for monthly contracts. Keep in mind that if you're reporting a handful of transactions, that works fine. Uh, but if, uh, uh, as Greg mentioned, we need the whole list line by line for every item, uh, you could end up with hundreds of lines. Uh, still possible on the screen, but uh, probably not very practical, especially if you start to hit, uh, you know, thousands of rows or something like that. That could be that could be daunting. Okay, so so like I said, you can still do it form entry on the screen, but also there's an option for file upload where all that information could be programmatically designed on your side. Maybe you have some kind of a, um, a, gener a software that generates all the transactions, and you can copy and paste them into an Excel template. And I will show you what the Excel template looks like here very quickly, but, but basically you can use file upload where you use a template, the SRP template, where you can in, input the data in it and you can upload that directly. Comma separated value, uh, that's also another option, but again, you need to stick to the format um, uh, that is uh, outlined in the Excel uh, template. Enterprise data interchange and API, both of these are available. If you're interested in using uh, EDI or API, uh, you can see the instructions under the data submissions submission section from the FAS SRP homepage. So you can use that to see uh, if, you, if you're interested in using that to submit uh, uh, sales to the SRP. Okay. So here's the contractor login page. So uh, on the left-hand side here of the screen, you can see uh, the register button on the bottom. Okay, so that's what I meant. As long as you are on a contract, as a point of contact with your email address, you just need that email address. You come here and you click register and it'll take you through the screens in order to register. Okay, a misspelled email address will not do. <laughs> okay, so you still have to have a good email address on contract and you come over here and you register as required. 
Okay, once you do that, then you can hit the contractor login. And um, and then and then you can log in to do whatever you need to do. On the right side of the screen here, you can see the GSA login. We also support the Veterans Affairs but on the right-hand side, but this is not something that you would go through. You would basically go to the contractor login over here, and then that will allow you to, to connect as needed. Okay. All right, so um, I'm gonna do something here real quickly, if you'll excuse me one second. All right, so um, let's go next. Uh, let's go to the uh, next screen. So after you log in, um, uh, I, you would get this page. Basically, I would like to bring your attention to the left side of the screen. Um, and that's where we have the SRP menus. They sit here um, and they have a, it's an accordion style, if you will, or like a, looks like it has an arrow here on the right-hand side. So there are a few menus here on the left-hand side. If you click the arrows, it will expand the menu and you can see the menu items underneath it. Yeah. So um, if you want to look at the contract's details, one of the things that, especially if you're switching from quarterly to monthly, you probably want to see um, you know, if that took effect and you, know, you want to know more about your contract's details. So you've come to the program management uh, uh, menu and you expand that and you would click on the contracts details page here. On the right hand side, you would see your information, make sure it matches what you expect. And then you would see the reporting frequency, whether you're monthly or quarterly. From the drop down menu, you can do the drop down here. Now, the system will limit you to only see what is assigned to you, again, what shows up on the contract master file. So that's where, um, that's where you would. Um, select your contract. Now, if you only have one, obviously it'll be one. If you have multiple, you can select whichever one. And then here you will see contract information, give you things like, you know, uh, contract status, header, whether it's open, header status, whether it's open or closed, when you start, when you end, et cetera. On the right side here of the screen, you can you see the contractor points of contact. So your name would be listed here. Otherwise you wouldn't uh, have been able to log into the system. And you can see who else in your organization has access to SRP as well. And then the bottom here, it'll give you the GSA points of contact. Again, it'll give name, phone number, and as well as email address. So now I'm gonna jump to, um, I will jump to the next screen here so that we can talk about form entry. Um, right, so here we'll talk about form entry um, and which is basically the main purpose of this uh, presentation, all right? So um, you would go here again on the left-hand side of the screen, if you can take a look at the reporting menu. Um, and you can use that arrow in order to expand the menu items and you would click on the form entry, um, you click on the form entry uh, menu item. So some of you here are, uh, um, some of them, some of you all who use uh, who are quarterly contractors, um, you're probably familiar with this. So you would go to the form entry, uh, but because if this is a uh, monthly contract, um, then the screen would react slightly differently, and we will talk about that here in a minute. So from the drop down menu, you can come in here and you can select your contract number. Okay, again, you'll only see those contracts that are assigned to you. Um, if you do have zero sales, uh, all you have to do is say, click on yes here for reporting zero sales, and then you're done. You just hit submit report. Actually, you wouldn't be done by clicking yes to zero sales. You have to click yes, and then you have to click submit report, and then you're done, okay? So it's very quick, very easy, but just make sure that you are you have the correct contract number selected here and the correct reporting period. In this example here, what you're seeing on the screen, obviously, I want to show you how you would go about it if you did have sales. So again, the form entry, then under reporting zero sales, you would say no. And then we would wanna go here and we would want to enter your task order number, delivery order number or procurement ID. Okay, so uh, you would enter a number here. And then when you do that, this add order uh, button 
would become live. So let's say I enter 111 here as an example, right? And here it is up here, right? Uh, so this is kind of the bottom part of the previous screen, right? You enter your information here, you click on add order, it will take you to this screen here. And your order number would be listed here. Now, it will present you with products versus services. And I think that's very similar to what you have seen with your quarterly uh, contracts. Uh, so it will, but, but, the, but this line here would be very different, right? It's not just showing you sin, it's breaking it up into products and services. And the drop down here, the sins that will show up here are also filtered by what is on your contract. Okay, so you would select your sin and then uh, your the fields that you're supposed to enter. Now, TDR has 16 fields. Not all of them are mandatory, but the ones that are will have this uh, 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 border in red, which means that you would not be able to submit unless every um, every field here that is mandatory is filled in. So you would go in here and you would put description of deliverable, manufacturer name, part number, et cetera, et cetera. And then you would fill that as needed. You would do the same thing for services, okay? The mandatory fields for services are different than those for product. Primarily your manufacturer name, manufacturer part number, okay? Those would not be here for services. So you would enter the required information here for your services. And now if you have additional products, right? Because it's not gonna be more than likely one single product that you sold, even though that does happen, you would click on the add line option here uh, or, or the add line um, link here on the screen and it will add additional lines for you to populate as needed. You would do the same thing here, add line for services, you know, to add, add lines as needed. Now, let's say you filled this in for order number 1111, but let's say you had you need to enter another order number with different products and services underneath that, maybe 2222, then what you would do here is that you would enter another, your, your PID or your task order number up here, and you would click add order again. And then that will give you another order number. And again, you would fill underneath that the product and the services information. Okay. Once you do that, um, um, you can keep filling this in as you need. SRP has a function where you can save your work and come back to it later, okay? Especially if you have a lot or you're waiting on a colleague, you, you need to know more information, you need additional invoices. So you can just do save only. And when you come back, you can continue. But in this case, we're saying, let's say, let's go ahead and click submit report. And once you submit, uh, your data now is in, okay? And that is definitely, like I said, uh, this can definitely be done this way. But if you have hundreds of lines, that can become pretty hefty to do it by hand. Even if you're using the save only function, it can get pretty, pretty tough and pretty uh, uh, non-practical, I want to say. So the other option here is to do file upload. And file upload, um, uh, like I said, you can rely on your uh, on an Excel spreadsheet. So I need to show you the Excel spreadsheet here, um, just so that you have an idea of what it looks like. Um, um, so, and also give you uh, a clue in how to actually see uh, the that template before you even opt into TDR. So let me take the screen over here, just to show you what we got. So this is the login screen for SRP. Oh, wait a minute, uh, I think. I need to switch screens so that you can see it. Here it is. Let me do that. Okay, I think that switched. So now you can see. So so this is uh, this is the screen uh, for the sales reporting portal, and here's where you log in. So even before you log in, all you have to do is scroll down, and you can take a look at the Fest SRP Excel template. Okay, so you click on that button, and it will show this screen for you, okay? It'll actually show you this Excel. You can download it onto your computer and you can read through it. But I would like, I think it's very useful if you're thinking about opting in to take a look at this. Uh, there's a lot of information in here to really make it simple. Uh, don't be intimidated that there's so much info here that it's gonna, it's gonna be this complicated or it's always gonna be complicated. Once you know how to fill this in, you really never have to look at this again necessarily. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but it, it's a good idea that everyone wants to come back here and kind of revise it. But but 
most of the contractors who do the TDR, they kind of read through this, kind of learn and understand what's required, what's not, what's mandatory, what's not. Um, and then, you know, they very rarely look at this tab. So here we have two tabs, the instructions tab and the report data tab. And like I said, the, the instructions tab, you look at it, you understand it, and then you probably, you know, have to look at, at it maybe every once in a while, okay? But it really explains how to populate the data, uh, how to fill in the data. One of the big things is you don't want to change the formatting of the cells in the Excel spreadsheet because SRP is looking at every uh, every field and they're looking at the format of every field, uh, okay? So that it's it gets ingested into the right format. Okay, but you read this, like I said, the instructions tab tells you how to fill it out. Let's take a look quickly at the report data tab. Here are the, like I said, the 16 fields, okay, for TDR, okay? Not all of them are mandatory. Some of them are, some of them are optional. And to know which ones are which, you just look at the instructions tab, like I said. I think I saw a, a question in the QA pod there that we're talking about. Uh, the federal customer. So again, in the instructions tab here, it gives you the uh, federal uh, customer code uh, and agency. So you can look at that and you can that will kind of be uh, uh, the table that you would use to determine what are the two digits code for, for specific uh, customer. Okay. Uh, but again, the instructions tab is very detailed. It'll probably answer 95% of your questions uh, in regards to how to fill out this uh, form. But But let's go in here. Again, pretty straightforward, okay? These fields are the same fields that show up when you're doing form entry. They're really the same ones. The difference is when I showed you the form entry uh, or on the, the fields in the user interface, the mandatory fields were highlighted. Okay, this is Excel, right? So Excel is not as smart as the system. Uh, so you have to kind of know which ones to fill in, which ones you won't. But Again, contract number, you put your PID number here, description of deliverable, manufacturing, manufacturer part number, et cetera, et cetera, right? I don't wanna go into detail on this, but what's mandatory for products, you would put your contract number here and you would report on the products the way you would on the form entry, right? So for services, manufacturing name, part number, you would leave blank, yeah? Um, and then and then the mandatory fields, if you have them, you would enter them. If you don't, then then you won't. Okay. So so it's it looks like the fields on the form entry page, okay? But uh, um, there are instructions obviously so that you can load this up as you need. So um for speaking from some contractors, I'm not gonna say I, I have a, a good sense of the number. Of contractors who do this, but some contractors definitely have some kind of an automated way to take the invoice data and transform it into um, uh, the right information or the right data that can be either copied and pasted into this Excel spreadsheet, or uh, they generate the data and automatically uh, fill in this spreadsheet. Uh, but and that and that works for them. And we have some contractors who submit. Uh, tens of thousands of uh, transactions, if needed, obviously. Some contractors just submit maybe a, a dozen or so. Um, so that's, that's uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. I wanted to show you the Excel spreadsheet first before we continue uh, with talking about file upload. So, so let's go to file upload here to see what it looks like on the screen. And I showed you that you can go to the SRP page before you even log in, scroll down and, and select that Excel spreadsheet, Excel template, so you can see what it looks like even now, if you like, you don't have to be opting into TDR. So that's one way to download the Excel template. The other way is if you look here at the screen, if you look at the left, uh, uh, left side here of the screen for under the reporting menu, you would click on the file upload. There's also a download template option here. Okay, so that's another way, but you have to obviously be logged in to do this um, uh, to see the download, the template that you need. Okay, um, so uh, let's say you have downloaded your template. You're smart on it. You know how to fill it in and you do, you put all your information in there. Um, now you come to the file upload menu item. First thing you wanna do is you wanna select your reporting period. Okay, you need to let the system know which reporting period 
you're reporting your sales for. And then you would click browse. And from this moment, you probably all are used to this. Uh, after you click browse, it you know, you browse your computer, find the file, select it, etc. Now here's the thing. Uh, if you have multiple contracts you need to report on, you can enter all that contract information, the multiple contracts on the same Excel template. Okay? So one file can satisfy multiple contracts, but you can only do it one reporting period at a time. You can't do multiple reporting periods in the same Excel template. So if you have multiple reporting periods you need to report on, you need to use multiple templates, okay? More than one file. So um, once you browse, you select your file, then the upload button over here uh, becomes active, and then uh, and then and then you upload it. Because the Excel template is not smart enough to tell you what's mandatory and what's not, the SRP has to do validations after you upload your file. So once you upload the file, it doesn't mean your data has already been ingested into SRP. What it means is that the uh, SRP will take your, your data and it'll determine whether or not you enter the correct data. So let's say you enter or you fat fingered the contract number. Well, guess what? It's gonna reject, right? So after you upload, it'll take us to the screen. Please pay attention to the report status. It gives you a number of things here. Okay, it tells you the reporting period you're reporting on. It tells you the file name that you submitted and the date that you submitted it. But please pay attention to here on the report status. So if you fat finger something, it's gonna say rejected. Obviously, if everything went right, it'll say submitted, it'll be green. It means the data has been adjusted. So here you come here, you click on the rejected icon, uh, and then it will actually show you what happened and how you can resolve it in order to make this work properly. Okay, so in this case here, in this example, it's saying something about unit of measures invalid, something was entered incorrectly, blah, blah, blah. But if you entered the wrong contract number, then it will say that as well, and it will tell you this is what you need to do to correct it, okay? So uh, so that's that's how you enter the data, how do you report your sales, whether it's via a form entry or file upload. And in the perfect world, maybe that's all you'd have to do. But every once in a while you realize you missed an invoice or somebody did more sales for a specific reporting period, period that you already reported on and you need to go back and do file adjustments. So let's do the file adjustment piece. So here, it's still under the reporting menu. If you look on the left side of your screen, it's still under the reporting menu, and you select the adjust data by file upload uh, option. You can also do adjust data, right? And this is if it was entered on the screen, it will show you on the screen line by line, and you have to do it that way. But right now, we're looking at the um, uh, file adjustment by file upload. So when you click on that, you would see your information, right? The, uh, uh, your company, you will see the reporting frequency, et cetera. Drop down menu, you select your contract and you select your reporting period because you need to tell SRP which reporting period you need to update or you adjust the sales for. And here you still have the option if you reported sales for the wrong reporting period, you still have the option to say, yeah, I reported a bunch of sales, but in reality I had zero sales. So you can select the, reporting sales yes option here, and then you will click submit and you're done, right? Um, um, to let the system know that you are reporting zero sales. But in this example, we are adjusting for some of the sales that we submitted. So we say, we're saying no here. And then you follow the same process where you browse to send your new, uh, new data. Now here's uh, one thing I would like to bring your attention. This does a complete overwrite. So if you reported three sales, but in reality you had seven sales that you wanted to report, right? So you missed four sales, four transactions. When you come to do the file adjustment, please do not just submit the new sales. Do not submit the four that you missed. You need to submit all seven because this does a complete overwrite for the report. So you come in here, after you select the contract number reporting period, you really want a fresh, a template that has all your data. So you browse for that, you find it, and then you upload here. And then once you do that, you still have to answer three questions, right? These questions have to be answered before the submit button becomes live. How was the reporting error discovered? What's the reason for the adjustment and how did it occur? And what's your firm doing in order to avoid that in the future? So you have to answer all these three, and then the submit button becomes live. 
and you can submit your data. All right. So uh, I'm going a little fast here because I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to do this relatively quickly. Okay. So industrial, that's that. So that's reporting and file adjusting. Uh, sales adjust, doing a sales adjustment uh, features in SRP. The next step here is the industrial funding fee. How, how, to, how to pay the industrial funding fee. Okay. Again, this is, it's due uh, no later than 30 days after the quarterly report period ends. So even if you're a monthly contract, you still have to report 30 days after the quarter ends. Okay. Now you can do it more often than that, but you don't have to pay every month. You need to report every month, but the payment can happen once every uh, once every quarter or four times a year. Yeah. Um, so uh, there is credit debit. So if for whatever, some reason you did a sales adjustment and um, you paid your industrial funding fee and you realize it was zero sales, so you paid too much for that reporting period, that becomes a credit for the next month or you can get a refund. Okay. So let's go through the screen of how you actually do this, right? So you can come uh, after you log in on the home screen, you can see this right away of what's due and what's not. That's one way you can uh, see if you can pay for your uh, industrial funding fee and you click on your contract in order to, uh, in order to make the payment. Uh, the other way is you can go to the payment screen on the left-hand side, as you can see, and you can see make payments. Um, so here you would have uh, two, uh, it'll show you information. Again, drop down menu, you can select your contract. It tells you the payable balance and the past due. These ideally should be the same, but sometimes you still have a payment balance uh, because of the current period, but the past due amount. And here you can determine whether or not you want to select which one you want to do. You click on pay now, takes you to the next screen here, gives you the breakout of what you're saying you would like to pay. It'll, the status will tell you whether it's past due or not. And down here, you have to check this box um, that says you understand that this is taking you out of SRP to the pay.gov. Okay, so the submit button will becomes live after you check this box. And then at the pay.gov, there are certain limitations. You can pay with three methods, either ACH, PayPal, or debit and credit. And here on the slide, it tells you the limits. ACH and debit cards have no limits. The other two, they do have limits. Then you select your method of payment, and then you go ahead and process it, and SRP will give you a payment confirmation. Okay. So um, the last screen here that I'm showing you, these are the, the folks that you can contact in case you need help. Um, uh, like I said, the Vendor Support Center, the phone number is here, email address is here, and they're awesome, and they, and they love to help you. So if you need any help, you can hit them up, and they will guide you uh, through any processes that you have to complete. And with that, I can turn it over. I think I'm out of time here, uh, but I can turn it over to Jack. So Jack, please take it away. No, that's good. You ran us right up to the last minute, so I love that. Um, just to be respectful of everybody's time, I'll keep this short and sweet. I just want to thank everybody for joining us today, um, especially our speakers, Greg, Steve, and Isa, for sharing their time and knowledge on this very important topic. Uh, reminder, the session recording, the, the slide deck, and the Q&A document will be shared via Mass Interact within a few weeks, right? And then the recording will also be on the Mass YouTube channel again within a few weeks. It takes a little bit to get it up there. Thank you again for joining, and we look forward to seeing everyone again next month. Thank you, everybody.